Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry, your source for all things Carpenter all the time. My name is Alex, your host, and joining me as always is Noel. Hello! And there will be no special guest for this episode because we are once again celebrating our favorite holiday, Halloween. Yeah, we don't really feel a need to subject this to anyone else. Yes, this is a journey. This is our lonely Incredible Hulk from the 1970s journey that we're walking. Yeah, and for now, this is going to be our last Halloween episode. (sighs) End of an era. End of an era. And what an episode to end off on. (laughs) Yeah, well, I mean, I will still... I already did an I Hate Love remakes on Rob Zombie's Halloween. I don't feel a need to do that again. But I will be doing at some point a solo review of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. There you go. Just because nobody else wants to do that with me, and I don't blame them. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yeah, this will be the last one you and I are covering for now, because mm. John is currently working on a new one, and it's, I think, Danny McBride is going to write and star in it, and I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who's going to be directing it. Oh, it's like David Gordon Green, isn't it? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a pretty good choice. Yeah, and John Carpenter is executive producing. He might do the score. We'll see. Fingers crossed. If that one ever comes across, Alex, you and I going to cover that one together? Of course. Yeah, God, this is our pre-end of the end of <laughs> Masters of Carpentry. God, we're almost done. We only have three more episodes of the main series left. I know, I know. It's very strange. It's been a long time. Where do we go from here? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. Oh, my God. <laughs> So anyways, yes, we are here tonight to discuss Halloween Resurrection, or I think it was one of those Hall 8 Ween Resurrections <laughs> that the title did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This was initially titled Halloween Homecoming. That makes more sense. But they wanted to make sure that people knew that he was still alive, so it became Resurrection. That's right. Because there was kind of a little bit of a finality with the last one. I can't imagine why. Yeah. It's almost as though they could have ended it there. Had they wanted to. But they wanted... This art could not be contained. So as we stated in our episode on Halloween H2O, the opening sequence for the eighth installment was already planned and locked in place before that film could be completed because the Akkads had it in their contract that Michael absolutely could not be killed without some way out of it. Thus, Kevin Williamson himself spat out the explanation that I'm sure we'll have many things to say about (laughs) in the coming minutes. The initial script and story were by Larry Bland. I'm sorry, Larry Bland. Almost fitting. That is a good Freudian name. Sleep. <laughs> the initial script and story were by Larry Brand. Getting a start with an episode of The Fall Guy, Brand has since gone on to write low-budget thrillers like Backfire, The Right Temptation, Psychic Murderer, Hard Luck, and A Perfect Man as well as director of The Drifter, the 1989 Mask of the Red Death, Overexposed, Till the End of the Night, Paranoia, The Basement, Christina, and the 2016 film The Girl on the Train. Oh, really? Which is not to be confused with the other 2016 film The Girl on the Train starring Emily Blunt. No, there were two completely different films titled The Girl on the Train released in 2016, and this is not that one. But why? (laughs) Don't know. I was shy when I looked it up. I'm like, oh, he directed that. Nope. <laughs> you guys are gonna say that's a big get. Yeah, and I'm like, wow, this guy's career was going places. Nope. No. <laughs> I don't know whether or not Larry Brand's original script began as a Halloween film because you know Dimension was very famous at this time for just taking original horror scripts and rejiggering them as franchise sequels. Ah, uh, the Die Hard effect. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. And they did that quite a bit with, like, Hellraiser and a couple of the Children of the Corns and stuff like that. However, I wasn't able to find out if this was one of those cases or not. I could totally see, like, Dangertainment yeah. being its own horror film, but I don't know if that was the case here. So, I don't know, question mark. So, the script was then rewritten by Sean Hood. And getting his start in the art departments of films like Slumber Party Massacre 3, Tank Girl, G.I. Jane, and Fight Club... He then started writing genre films like The Darklings, Cube 2 Hypercube, (laughs) The Crow 4 Wicked Prayer, the one starring Edward Furlong, 
Midnight Movie, the 2011 Conan the Barbarian, The Legend of Hercules, the one with Kellen Lutz, not Dwayne Johnson, and The Dorm, as well as episodes of Masters of Horror and Fear Itself. All right. So he's kind of become the go-to guy for turning out clock. Yeah, I was going to say, he's a uh, B-horror journeyman. Which I will say, I've actually gone through some of his other films. Not a bad writer. And I highly recommend his brother, Brendan Hood, who has only done a couple of films. He did this infamous film, They, which became Wes Craven Presents They. There's like entire chronicles on the internet of how badly they ruined his script by bringing like a dozen other writers. Uh. Fascinating story. And a great original script. But he did not write this, so we'll move on. The film is again produced by Mustafa and Malik Akkad, as well as Paul Freeman, who's been doing this with them since part four. Not only is this Freeman's last in the series, but this is where we have to sadly bid adieu to Mustafa Akkad. Yeah, tragically. In 2005, while he and his daughter Rima were in Jordan for a wedding, I believe in the past I said it was her wedding, it was not. Both were among the crowd killed by a suicide bomber. It was a very sad loss. Indeed. Again, Mustafa Akkad, he's mostly known for producing the Halloween films, but seriously, I highly recommend people go back and look at some of the films he directed back in the 70s. He was a very, very good filmmaker in his own right, and a very tragic loss to the industry, and that he had to lose also members of his family. Just an absolutely horrible event. Mm Mm-hmm. So alongside the Akkad-owned company of Troncos International, the film was again produced and distributed by Dimension Films, a branch of Miramax owned by Bob and Harvey Weinstein. Joining the producers for the only time is Michael Lee, I don't know if it's Lay, Lie, it's L-E-A-H-Y, who also produced the wonderful classics Mimic 2, Children of the Corn 7, Hellraiser 6, or 7, I can't remember which one Hellseeker was, The Feast and Pulse Trilogies, and the infamous classic Dean Koontz's Phantoms. <laughs> we need to bring that one up as many times as we possibly can. I'm restraining myself from the uh, the mimetic catchphrase for that. <laughs> Dwight H. Little, the director of Halloween 4, was initially in talks to return to this, but ultimately passed. I don't know why. Well, I think we can guess why, but I don't know why. <laughs> then Whitney Rancic signed on to direct. After debuting with the 1994 crime thriller Handgun, Rancic has largely worked in television doing episodes of Homicide, ER, Nash Bridges, Martial Law, and Smallville. He probably got the job because he also directed a really obscure indie film, like I seriously can't find copies of this anywhere, in 1998 called Shock Television, which is about a robbery gone wrong told entirely through surveillance footage, Hmm. which kind of sounds similar thematically to this movie. Yeah, I could see that. hesitate to say gimmick, but that sort of device, yeah. The producers unfortunately had some level of doubt about Rancic, especially due to his lack of experience with feature films, so they ended up firing him right before shooting began. But he did guide the film through development and cast a number of people, but also with his firing, there were some big casting shakeups that I'll probably get into. Mm. So in comes Rick Rosenthal returning to the franchise after having directed way back in 1981 Halloween 2. <laughs> He also was primarily a director in television with episodes of Early Edition, The Practice, Wasteland, Law & Order, SVU, Witchblade, Buffy, Veronica Mars, and also Smallville. But unlike the other guy, he has a much broader feature directorial career with classic works like American Dreamer, The 1983 Bad Boys, Ruskies, Distant Thunder, Nasty Boys, Devlin, Just a Little Harmless Sex, Nearing Grace, Drones, and The Birds 2 Land's End, for which he's credited as Alan Smithy. (laughs) And I didn't realize he's also a twice Emmy-nominated producer on Transparent. Oh, well, there you go. Good for him on that. Yeah. So, getting into my extensive synopsis of the movie. <laughs> I'm all ears because I want to remember exactly what happened. <laughs> Immediately following the events of Halloween H2O, it didn't take long for authorities to figure out that the figure Laurie Strode decapitated was not that of her brother Michael Myers, but rather a paramedic with whom Michael switched outfits who couldn't speak due to a crushed larynx. Blamed for the death and seemingly despondent over guilt, Lori finds herself tucked away in the friendly neighborhood Smith's Grove Sanitarium. Several years later, Michael comes for her, killing guards in his wake as Lori lures him into a snare on the roof. She's unwilling to kill him without making sure it isn't again another man under the mask, allowing Michael to finally get his hands on her and send his sister to the grave. R.I.P. And that's it. That's all we're going to talk about tonight. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Actually, before we get to the rest of the movie, why don't we just talk about that opening? Because it's kind of a film unto itself. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something. So do you recommend the first 10 minutes of Halloween Resurrection? I do not recommend the first 10 minutes of Halloween Resurrection. It is ludicrously bad. <laughs> it's... 
I always say one of the marks of a bad film is if everyone sounds dubbed from the get-go. <laughs> everyone sounds like an Italian low-budget horror. It's really tremendously noticeably bad, especially after coming off of the last one, which had like a mm -hmm. nice professional sheen to it. This one is just so badly filmed. There's POV shots of Michael Myers headbutting a door. Like, I don't need to see that. That's yeah. really jarring. Yeah, I don't recommend those first 10 minutes either because it's, again, hey, it's Kevin Williamson's idea, an idea he had to come up with due to contractual obligations. It's so cynically executed, I too, know. where everyone's just like, yeah, I guess this happened. Like, no yeah. one's really, really committed. It feels like a contractual obligation. Yeah, everyone looks pained to say it. And even, like, poor, poor Laurie Strode, which I don't even know why they're calling her Laurie Strode. It's like, oh, let's take her back to her old name just because she's in the sanitarium or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah, not Carrie Tate. Yeah, exactly. Nope, she's Laurie Strode now, and we know all her history, and we're just going to gossip about that, and then she's just going to sit there sad until Michael chases her on a roof, and even yeah. her attempts to home alone him come to no avail. <laughs> yeah, they kind of lost me when, yeah, you had first the POV shots of Michael headbutting the door as he's looking through the window. And it's like just digitally in post shake the camera to make it look like he's headbutting it. Yeah, that's like Jaws 3 level, not goodness. And then him just walking through the door. Yeah, <laughs> he's done opening doors now. We are straight back into Michael in Terminator mode. Yeah. And then, yeah, just the absurd thing of she home alone him. But she can't kill him unless she makes sure it's really him. So she's got to put her hands within his grasping distance to pull off his mask. It just makes sense. Why not just say, if you're not Michael Myers, take off your mask. You got five, four, three. Two. Just like the person should have done in the first place instead of just calmly outstretching his hand. Because obviously the police officer who shoved his hand up the open neck hole of the severed head was able to take off the mask. Yeah. Because that's what police officers do. They don't let forensics onto a crime scene until they shove their hand up the severed head neck hole. Well, I mean, you gotta know. And peel off a rubber mask. It's the initial clues. You gotta put your fingerprints all over everything to try and solve the case in the first half hour. Then you get a bonus. Yeah, I mean, these first 10 minutes are just infuriating. Yeah, it's really bad. I was hoping to be down with it, like, when they had the patient who knows all the serial killer trivia, mm -hmm. and I'm just like... Oh, okay, this will be, like, fun bad, but no, it was bad bad. And then Michael Myers comes and gives him his knife. I kind of like that twist. Because <laughs> it feels <laughs> like something silly. Michael would do. Yeah, I guess. He does have a slight sense of whimsy. But even then, like, the guy's trivia is, and then he returned and killed four students. No, he killed two students, a teacher, and then a nurse and two other teenagers at a different location. Yeah, it would take an hour and a half to watch the movie, guys. Do your homework. It was as bad as I was expecting it to be. It was, but you know what was good? Her fall looked great. Oh, yes, that her falling back. And even that you could see her land. I just yeah. remembered her disappearing into the trees. That was a nice touch. No, it was really cool. It looked really good. Kudos for that. I got to give Jamie Lee Curtis credit. She went out like a pro. Oh, yeah. She did her job. She didn't want to do this, but it's something she had agreed to several years earlier in order to get the ending she wanted. So she at least gave it to him. Yeah. Just even learning that history, that this was something that they had in plan, even as they were making H20. It's just, why? I don't know. It's very strange. And that they still went through with it. It's so confusing and sad. I think they missed the window, like, because all the horror reboots were, like, just a couple years off. If they had just been like, let's just reboot instead, I would have been so supportive of that. Yeah. So, anyways, you ready for me to jump to the synopsis for the remainder of the movie? Yes. Just, yeah, that's, let's just leave that opening. It's sad. Let's, <laughs> goodbye. So with nothing else to do, Michael returns to his dilapidated home in Haddonfield only to find out it's been filled with props and cameras from the internet reality show Dangertainment.com that a group of college kids laden with cameras and flashlights have been hired to pretend to investigate the house for viewing audiences. Michael doesn't take well to this, especially when his subterranean lair beneath the home is discovered, so he starts killing off the kids one by one until some final girl attacks him with a chainsaw, and Busta Rhyme starts nailing him with flying roundhouse kicks. <laughs> Michael is sliced up, electrocuted, and once again burned in a fire, but he manages to come to in the morgue right before a coroner can peel off his melted mask. So Alex, do you recommend the remaining 80 minutes of Halloween Resurrection? I have a caveat. I recommend it if you were where I was when I saw it in the theater <laughs> with the audience I saw it with who was tearing it apart. <laughs> then I recommend it. Otherwise, no. <laughs> As a Halloween film, I do not recommend it. It is just sad, disappointing, and especially building off that first 10 minutes. However, 
as a goofy slasher film about bad horror reality shows, which, my God, I watched a lot of back in the day. Mm -hmm. I recommend it. I can see this. I actually thought it was it's not smart, but I thought it was fun. I thought it at least was competently put together in the writing and directing department. The characters are kind of fun. (laughs) The actors are kind of fun. There are some fun kills and moments in there. Like the whole bit of the teenage audience watching everything play out at the party. I kind of liked it. I wasn't as bitter and disappointed about those 80 minutes as I was that opening sequence. Yeah. It's like once you get past that opening sequence... I actually kind of recommend it if you want just a goofy, silly slasher movie. I can agree with that, actually. I was really dreading it because I'm like, I remember it being like kind of fun and whatever. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they introduced the concept of the internet, (laughs) (laughs) then I'm just like, oh, I love it when people do movies about the internet. (laughs) Yes. In that regards, it did not disappoint. This movie is in that charming, naive way (laughs) of like, let's be so current that we are 20 years behind. And here's the thing. For as much crap as Busta Rhymes gets for being in this movie... I knew they had kind of won me over when you had the scene of the two Michael Myerses walking around the house. And it turns out that one of them is Busta Rhymes in a Michael Myers outfit who starts chewing out the real Michael Myers for missing his mark. That scene was pretty great. I think my only note says meta (laughs) with Michael trailing Michael. Not only was the buildup nice, but then just how long he goes at chewing out Michael. And then the great payoff is that Michael is just kind of like, well, fuck it, and just turns and walks away. Because <laughs> <laughs> at that point, man, yeah. he was right. He was right. He made some good points. He's like, what am I going to gain by killing him right now? Let's just see where this goes. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what did you think of Buster Rhymes? He saved the movie for me. As soon as he starts doing martial arts at the end, I'm just like, thank you. <laughs> thank you for saving me, for saving this film, and for saving us all, Buster Rhymes. You got us all in check. As silly as he is... As totally off as he is from this as a franchise. Yeah. God, was he fun to watch. (laughs) He was fun to watch. He is very bad, but he's watchably bad, which I cannot say the same for Tyra. He can't act, but he is glowing charisma. Yes, it's true. It's true. He is having a great time. He's all smiles half the time. He's given it 110%. He is missing all his cues and his lines, but he's delivering them with chutzpah. I regret that we never got a sequel where we could have him and Paul Rudd play off each other. That would be wonderful. Just to see what would happen. I would finance that movie. But yeah, Busta Rhymes, he's Freddie Harris, the head of this reality show program. I was kind of surprised. I didn't remember that it was called Dangertainment. <laughs> I forgot until the second time you said it. That was a, that was a title. Yeah. I'm hoping that wasn't originally a spec script title. Uh, who knows? <laughs> I remember because I think it was like right around 2000 or maybe even 99 or something was when Ghost Hunters started. Oh, yeah. And that led to that whole wave of, let's put a whole bunch of IR cameras around a haunting, let's pretend scary noises are happening. And then I remember MTV had, let's stick D-list celebrities in supposedly haunted locations where we'll absolutely (laughs) rig up sound effects to mess with them. I remember that whole wave of shows, and oh, God, did I watch so many of them. Oh, yeah, for sure. And they all revolve around someone going, what's that? (laughs) To nothing. (laughs) What was that? No, and I love the character of Rudy, played by Sean Patrick Thomas. We'll get to our leads in a second when we remember Mm. them. But Rudy, played by Sean Patrick Thomas, who, God, was he beautiful in this movie. I love that he, from the very beginning, is like, hey, this bottle of, like, sage that should be moldy smells fresh. (laughs) Hey, why was this book just planted here? Hey, why would everyone just leave everything behind? Hey, why are there these trap doors? And why is there this key strapped to a baby's chair? (laughs) I love that he is just so observantly on top of the fact that everything here is set up. Yeah. Why did they bring in fresh fennel? (laughs) He was just such a fun character in that, you know, he's the stoner who always goes on about food. Yeah, that's what my notes were. He loves food. That's his thing. But by also making him be the one who's the most observant about everything, Mm -hmm. and by casting someone as beautiful as John Patrick Thomas is, it really made him a fun, interesting character. He was Shaggy-esque, except not a coward. Right, and that, but that's what I like, is that he's typically the character that would be Shaggy, but he's kind of played atypically. Yeah, no, I did appreciate that as well. And I was sad when he died. He died? Oh, no, I didn't know that. He was the one in the kitchen, who then Michael, like, pinned oh, to the door. Oh, sorry, I thought you meant the actor. I thought you were, because oh, I'm still on oh, Mustafa. God, no. 
Okay, no. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't believe any of the actors in this movie have met tragic ends. Okay, that's good. So far. Yeah, I was sad when he died, and I was sad when Katie, uh, the Sack, Sackhoff, met her yeah. untimely end as well. Those were the two uh, my favorites of the leads. Yes, Katie Sackhoff is in this movie. Not as that great of a character, but she's, again, really fun to watch. She has charisma, that's for sure. She is just bubbling off the screen. She is wonderful. Yeah. So let's get to our lead, Sarah, played by Bianca Kajlik. I hope I pronounced that right. Who it was so odd to see. I forgot that she was the lead in this because I've seen her on Rules of Engagement. You know that sitcom with David Spade and Patrick Warburton? Oh, yeah, I remember that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's part of one of the main couples in that. Oh, okay. And she's been on Undateable for a couple of years. She's really gone into sitcoms. Okay. But I forgot she was the lead in this, and I saw this back in the day. I can understand that. <laughs> she's uh, She doesn't quite leap off the screen in this particular vehicle. Right. I don't know that that's entirely her fault. It's just, again, a very basic final girl. Yeah. You know, she's the innocent, while everyone else around her is kind of skeezy. Yeah, the old tired old cliches. Uh, and then they give her that one, like, forced, she can scream loud. Which she can't. No. No. Yeah, the actress is completely incapable of screaming, and so they had to dub over a scream. But I'm thinking, oh. if we're doing a scream that's supposed to shatter glass, wouldn't it be like a high-pitched thing? Yes, it would be. But it's not. No, it's not. Again, the sound design in this movie is weird. The sound design is incredible. Incredibly weird. The Foley effects are nuts. Like, the electricity sound effects are, like, yeah. straight out of, like, Bride of Frankenstein. Everything sounds like a watermelon's being stabbed constantly. <laughs> well, actually, in truth, a lot of the stabbing effects were, let's put a wig on a watermelon. Oh, was it? So there were there were stabs on camera of a, of a watermelon. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But yeah, it was very... The whole movie is just very strangely constructed. It's like almost hallucinogenic. <laughs> I know. And there's some bits of that that I like. Like there are a lot of background sounds that I like, but yeah, there's other ones that are just so obvious. Yeah. And again, like what was it with computers in the 90s and early 2000s where we have to put a sound effect over someone moving a mouse? Uh, I don't know. It's the same as when they thought that every time you swung a knife, it had to have like that metal sliding on metal sound. Yeah. <laughs> it's worth pointing out that we mentioned there was another director attached to this movie who was fired right before filming began. There was a different actress in the lead. She's an actress I'm not hugely familiar with. Jacinda Barrett. She still pops up in TV shows now and then. And Bianca, who plays Sarah, was originally cast in the Katie Sackhoff role. Oh, okay. And Katie Sackhoff was originally cast in the role of Donna, the other woman in the group. The redhead? Yes. Okay. What did you think of Donna? She was all right. Didn't really jump out too much at me. She did her job well. Hers is usually the most thankless role as well, where she, you're topless and you're now covered in skeletons. Yeah, she has the boob shot, and her big thing is that she's supposed to be the, I want to say, she's the college student who believes overly in symbolism and deconstructing what the meaning of things are mm -hmm. in an attempt to look cool. But it's really there also for the foil for the oversexed harasser boy. Yeah, they went weird places with those two. They did. And there was a lot more of her in the script that was cut. I did read a draft of the script, which is mostly the shooting script. There was a lot of this movie that was cut out, but a lot of it was just dialogue, just trims, banter. Mm. Nothing that really would have made her character any better. But yeah, I, I forgot that she was in this movie. I forgot that there were even boobs in this movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I should mention, I did see this film probably a year after it came out when it hit video. You said you saw it in the theater? Oh, I saw it in the theater because I was really big on the Halloween franchise at the time. So I went and it turned out to be a wonderful experience. <laughs> it was like a late night screening and the audience was not having it. And right. they were just like adding a lot of <laughs> special ambiance to it. And it was great. I loved H2O so much that even seeing the trailers for this, I'm like, I'm getting a bad vibe. Yeah, you were right. So I waited until it hit video. But I know even back then, I enjoyed parts of the movie, even though I was kind of pissed that it was a Halloween sequel. Right. There's certain horror films that I always have affection for just because I enjoyed watching them. Right. <laughs> Not that they're good movies. And then again, I probably was wrong to be pissed about it because this is a franchise that also had Halloween's 5 and Halloween 6. Exactly. It's not exactly an untarnished reputation. Right. This is an odd angle to take with a slasher film, but it's an angle you could apply to pretty much any slasher franchise. You know, let's take the main setting, make a reality show of it. The real killer shows up. You could do that so many other ways. Whereas like Halloween's 5 and Halloween 6 are pretty much doomed from the get-go. That's true. Of just bad ideas. For sure. Like the whole conceit of the uh, reality show and like the multi-camera angles, 
with a more skilled hand, could have done a lot of really interesting things with it than what they did. Yeah, I mean, especially in the post-paranormal activity era now. Oh, exactly. Like, if they had just made it, like, just a little tighter, a little more spare, it's just not very well constructed. And had better quality mini cameras. Exactly, yeah. Everything looks like a beta cam or something. Yeah, this was a few years before we hit HD. Yeah, for sure. Everything looks like the videotape from the ring. And, you know, to their credit, a lot of this, they would film the scenes twice. They would film the scenes with the regular cameras, and then they would let the actors just go around with the actual cameras on their heads. Mm. And then a lot of that was just putting the film together and editing. And some of that works really well. Some of it's a mess. It's an interesting gimmick that I don't think they were quite ready for yet. No, they definitely weren't. Everything moves like slow motion in this movie. All the kills are so slow. All the kills are pretty badly put together. Yeah. It should be remembered in Halloween 2, most of the kills were actually John Carpenter going back and doing reshoots himself. Okay, I guess that makes sense. Everyone just kind of stands there and waits for Michael to slowly insert something. <laughs> well, let's talk about the Michael in this movie. It was played by Brad Lorre, who had never played him before. Yeah, he's back to Frank and Michael. He's just kind of lurching around. It's weird because it's like he's a mix of the two. It's like I think the actor is trying to play the genuine Michael, but the way the scenes are all constructed and directed, it's the Terminator Michael. Yeah. So it's like none of his performance really means anything because it's still Michael just barreling through things and having super strength and just walking through doors. A lot of peeking around corners as well. That part I didn't mind as much because I like a stalking Michael. Yeah. But again, he's not really building tableaus. He just kills people and leaves them there. Pretty much, yeah. You know, he's not like putting out a display for the can. I mean, the one kill, the one kill that was nice, even though it was fully ripped off from the old 1960s film Peeping Tom, was him and the cameraman. Yep. Where he's holding up the camera with the spiked tripod end. I noticed that. Though it's worth mentioning, that was the one kill that wasn't in the scripts. Someone during shooting had to have seen Peeping Tom and was like, I've got an idea. <laughs> nice homage. He also copies his descending from the pipes maneuver in the beginning of the movie. Right, which the director on the commentary actually intentionally said, yeah, we did that just because it was a neat thing from H2O. But that's the thing where even with Michael's mask, and I couldn't tell if this was the same mask from H2O or if they made a new one, but even then they're trying to do the spiky hair again. It's like they're trying to do a lot of what H2O did they just aren't doing it very well. Right. I think it's a different mask. It looks different. Even they yeah. have the flashbacks and everything, and it looks like a more thin face to it. And it's gone back to no eyes. Well, no, at least they're more shaded. And I noticed he did actually have black makeup around his eyes, kind of like they do with Batman. Oh, uh, okay. But you could see his eyes quite a bit. And then I know Busta Rhymes was wearing one of the older masks, like I think the Halloween 6 mask. Oh, uh, I see. Which was so weird seeing him talk through the Michael Myers mask with the mouth moving. It looks like old masks from like old science fiction films where the mouth just doesn't move properly. <laughs> But when he actually talks in it, because he's such an animated talker. How dare you lecture our planet, Captain Kirk? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to give the actor a bit more credit because he's not as cumbersome as we saw in some of the other more terminator -y ones. But they're not really letting him be the kind of more graceful and intelligent Michael. No, not at all. It is also interesting that this film seems to be setting up this backstory for Michael, like his childhood and all that stuff, and that ends up all being bullshit. Which I appreciated at the end because I was getting really anxious about it. I'm like, oh, no, don't do this. Don't do this, that it's like a torture house or something where they're like they had a satanic child or like they were in right. on the uh, Samhain rituals. The baby chair with the straps on it. Yeah, and I'm just like, no way. And then I'm like, oh, okay, cool. That's all bullshit for the thing, which I appreciated. And so they don't really say anything about his backstory, which is as they should. Yeah. But I do like that he does actually have his own underground layer under the house. Which makes sense, because he was kind of doing that. He was like eating a dog or something in like Halloween 1 or yeah. 2 or something, yeah. And here he has half-eaten rats that are still alive. Which makes no sense. <laughs> you know, I almost wish that instead of having had that whole opening sequence, if they had scrapped that and just have it be that... And he caught up with his sister, and she chopped off his head was just a part of the legend. Yeah, I would like that. And just don't say if that's real or not. Just have it be a legend that's related to us as backstory for the reality show. Yeah. And just don't explain how Michael is still here. Exactly. I would appreciate that. It's just another film. Michael's still around. Did he die? Was that bullshit? Did he come back? Who knows? Who knows? It's just a legend. It's a Haddonfield legend. This tiny town with a giant university. And then what did you think of the ending where he absolutely dies and will never come back again? 
I appreciated that, that they finally just put a nail in the coffin, so to speak, and then just killed him off. Who are we kidding? I know. It had a perfect way to end it, too, with Busta shutting off the camera. I'm like, based on what you've been trying to say with this movie, which I assume is reality television is bad. Right. You should have cut it there instead of giving us this lame, tired, every single Friday the 13th, although it does it in the opening, not the closing, of him on the slab opening his eyes. And they have, on the DVD, they have like four other endings. I'm not surprised. They couldn't figure out what to do, and... The director seriously did try to talk the studio into just doing like they did with Clue. Just let's send a different ending to each theater. That would have been great. Which they didn't do. Yeah. And uh, let's see what the endings were. We had that one. You know the scene where before we cut to the coroner's office, they go up to the body bag and they're like, open it up, let us see. As they're like talking to Michael and Busta's giving him shit for being crispy. That's when Michael wakes up and grabs Busta. And Sarah grabs an axe from the fire truck and buries it in Michael's skull. (laughs) Then one of the other endings is Miles. We'll talk about Miles in a second. We forgot to bring him up. He's the computer guy, Deckard. Oh, right. Yeah. There was an ending where he actually is the one who dives in and rescues her and pulls her out. Okay. There was an ending where everyone clears the scene and like the CSI squad goes in to start processing it. And they come to that manhole cover. And one of the agents opens up the manhole cover and then Michael's hand shoots up and grabs her in the face and then cuts black. That's silly. (laughs) They just were kind of all over. Yeah, not really a super cohesive vision on this one. No. Well, yeah, so let's go ahead and talk about Miles, played by Ryan Merriman. Uh, he was all right, I guess. I don't know. I liked the people watching from the party. Right. But he was kind of like, I don't know, the nerdy thing where, like, he's a nerd and he's really good. But if you look back on it, like, no, he's being super deceitful and gross and tricking this girl into thinking that he's, like, someone he isn't and stuff like that. But he was, right. I guess he did a fine job and his friend was obviously just the semi-comic relief. Yeah. Do you think anyone will know that they're dressed like the people from Pulp Fiction? Uh, who could say? I love that that's actually a dubbed over line. Hey, do you think anyone will recognize us as the two guys from Pulp Fiction? Like, <laughs> why? Why did you need to point that out? Well, actually, when I first saw him, I'm like, oh, is he Neo from The Matrix? <laughs> <laughs> Again, I like that idea of all these teenagers watching what they think is a show. He's the only one who starts to think it's real. And then I actually really like the third act where he's starting to play a video game with a real person. He's sending messages to guide this player through the mansion. Absolutely. And with a skilled hand, that would have been great. That would have yeah. been a great, like, new horror film, like Don't Look or whatever, Don't Breathe movie is and stuff mm. like that. I kind of like that idea of then, like, Sarah becomes the playable character in a video game. And you're watching this audience playing the game of her real life. And it's just... If they had brought in Kevin Williamson to do a few punches, he could have done some amazing stuff on that. I can understand why he didn't want to. Yeah. I like Sean Hood as a writer. I've liked some of his other genre films. He is not strong enough to pull off that level of meta. And it's like, they would even just kind of forget the audience is there. Yeah. Like, we don't see them for like 10 minutes as things are going on that you would think they would be reacting to. It just, it could have been good. It could have been good, but it's just too slow. And it just ends up being, he's in the hall. He's still in the hall. He's still alive. He's right behind. I, I did like that bit where they look up and turn around and he's right behind. Yeah. Hey, guys. <laughs> but it was an interesting early attempt to start doing meta commentary using the new emerging technology. Again, they weren't quite there yet. Yeah. But I do applaud them for it. Yeah. And they could have done a better job even now with all the GoPros and whatnot. Yeah. Let's just kind of round out the other. There were just two other guys in the house. We had Thomas Ian Nicholas as Bill. You're going to have to tell me which one is which. <laughs> he was the one from American Pie, who I think, wasn't he also the one, Rookie of the Year? And he was also Kid in King Arthur's Court. Fair enough, fair enough. I think he's the one who uh, Michael jumps out of the mirror. Yep. Candy mans him. And stabs him in the head, which is a wig on a watermelon. Amazing. Uh, yeah, he was fine. Yeah, again, he's not around long enough to really make an impression. Exactly, yeah. I think the only three I really enjoyed was... Katie, Busta, and who was the food guy? Rudy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then our last one is Jim, played by Luke Kirby, who was that weird, faux, dark, brooding hipster guy. Christian Slater, Mark II. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, hey, God. guys. Christian Slater would have been great in that role. <laughs> yes, he would have. Michael Myers is inside every one of us. <laughs> He's you. <laughs> I don't think he is, though. <laughs> 
I kind of like how obvious they are that he's just kind of bullshit. Yeah, no, that was appreciative. Although it kind of mirrors Ghosts of Mars where he's just constantly on this girl and then finally she's like, okay, let's make it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do like that whole bit where they have their sex scene and then suddenly all these bodies fall on them. Mm -hmm. And he's like, they still have made in Taiwan stickers. <laughs> They're just hoping that no one will notice. <laughs> yeah. Of course, impressing us with her lengthy performance throughout the film, Tyra Banks. Yeah. <laughs> Who's there? I've watched her and Buster Rhymes cheers each other with red wine three times. I've got the mm -hmm. movie playing in the background. And of course, she has her big scene where she's making the mocha. The craziest mocha I've ever seen with like whipped cream and like all this stuff going into it. It has to be elaborate enough for her to not notice someone dying. That's right. I did appreciate that. I'm just like, this is becoming farcical and I, I'm enjoying that. <laughs> I should say one of the scenes that was cut was her being killed. I don't think we really lost anything. No, it doesn't look like that. We still see her body. Yeah, the kills aren't really super memorable. But I know that was supposed to follow immediately when Buster Rhymes meets up with Michael and thinks he's the other actor. He's like, dude, go back out to the shed. Check with her, see what her schedule is. That's when Michael was going to go out and kill her. Oh, okay, that makes sense. And I'm trying to think if there were... What other big things can we mention from this movie? What other gloriously memorable events? Going after Michael with a chainsaw. Yeah, that was a, a big one. That was great, though it just stops working. Yeah, which I kind of appreciated as well, but they both were just kind of like, eh? <laughs> I was like, you got to layer the joke. There's got to be like another payoff instead of like, oh, it stopped working. Womp womp. Though I do like that they did the old George Reeves Superman villain of just throw the chainsaw at him and he'll flinch. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I got a lot of notes about how great Busta Rhymes is under him <laughs> watching TV. Yeah, I got a note that just says, these are non-scenes. <laughs> I'm not sure what I meant. And I should mention, there were quite a few cutscenes on the DVD, and there is apparently, like the producer's cut of Halloween 6, there is a work print cut that's been floating around the internet that's like 20 minutes longer. Oh, okay, I believe that. I'm not going to force you to watch it with me. <laughs> I appreciate that. Because even just reading the script, I can see a whole lot of stuff that was cut, but it's all mostly just meaningless chatter. The big stuff that was cut were the opening title sequence of the film was going to play out over home video footage of this angry little child. Okay. And there's a scene in the movie where they find a book. In the final cut of the movie, it's a coloring book. In the original cut, it was a book of family photographs of the same angry child. But it, of course, all turned out that that was all just fake stuff from the reality oh, show. Oh, I see. Then there was another thing where... I don't know if you remember, there's this bit where when we first get to the Myers house, they're towing away a red Camaro. Yeah, I, I don't remember seeing it, but I remember them talking about it. The red Camaro was a plot point where early on in the movie, after he killed Lori, there was going to be, you remember that scene from H2O where it's the woman and her child in the bathroom and he steals her oh, car? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was going to steal someone else's car, but of course it was going to be two teenagers in the woods having sex in the tent. Ah, uh, of course. <laughs> he doesn't kill them, but he does steal their car. And then there was going to be a scene with Sarah where she starts seeing this red Camaro following around, kind of like Lori did back in the first movie. Oh, yeah. And then when she's heading out to the location, she sees the Camaro following her, pulls over, and then the Camaro just starts, you know, like taunting her and all that stuff. And none of that stuff really added anything. It would have been fine, but it's not necessary. No, for sure. And even then, a lot of the dialogue that was cut was just the characters constantly reinstating who they are as characters. <laughs> I enjoy food. I enjoy marijuana. I ironically overanalyze everything. I'm an idiot, but you're hot. <laughs> so there wasn't really anything that was lost. And again, even the script had like, ending, alternate ending one, alternate ending two. Yeah, I don't really need to see more, and I didn't actually totally resent to watching this. <laughs> no, just to clarify, I'm not recommending this movie, but I'm not vehemently not recommending it. If you're at a party, you should watch it like those kids did in this movie. If you like 80s slasher films like April Fool's Day or Happy Birthday to Me or The Burning, the ones that weren't that good, but they're watchable enough that they're kind of fun. Yeah, for sure. This is one of those movies that it's not good. It doesn't fit the Halloween franchise, but it actually has some interesting ideas. Everyone seems like they're kind of having fun making it after the first 10 minutes. From all the behind the scenes I saw, the cast really had a lot of fun, largely because they got to film a lot of the movie themselves. Yeah, I could see that, uh, of that being an actual fun set to shoot on. You know what? This is actually the first Halloween movie that feels like an 80s movie to me. Hmm. 
given that it's a very modern use of the technology, it does have that retro feel. Yeah. They all felt like 70s or 90s. Yeah. And this is the first one that feels like an 80s. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll agree with that. Because it's a bit campy, a bit fun, doesn't take itself too seriously. Kills are terrible. <laughs> Very 80s. And the score was fine. It was like someone gave them the score to Halloween H2O and were like, just give us more. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's anything else to really bring up about the movie. Uh, I keep checking my notes. Uh, we covered the fennel. That was important to me. The fennel, yeah. Lots of busta notes. For some reason I wrote Julia sucks on my notes. <laughs> Because my wife was up to something. <laughs> yes, did she watch any of the movie? Yeah, she watched most of it with me. <laughs> what did she think? She was mostly trying to talk to me about stuff that she bought at home since. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think she was too invested. No, nor, nor should she be. Yeah. I wrote Boys Are Creeps. Uh, <laughs> this is the lamest party ever. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote down a lot of the uh, weird things they say to each other, which were always like, oh, you crack me up <laughs> after he's like clearly harassing her. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, so foul. <laughs> <laughs> See, I like dialogue like that because it's just so over the top. It's very anachronistic and endearing. <laughs> I even love the exchange. It's so awful, but I love the exchange. He's like, you have great legs. When do they open? <laughs> and so she flips him off and he goes, oh, one o'clock. <laughs> uh, everyone looks like they're 30 to me. So that's why it's always like, oh, it's just a bunch of adults. At least they're not high schoolers. They are genuinely college kids. That's true. Yeah, that's a nice touch. But yeah, the dialogue does have a nice genuinely cheekiness to it. Yeah, everyone seems to be having fun, especially um, Katie Sackhoff, whose smile lights up the screen. I won't go so far as to say wit because we just had a brilliant Kevin Williamson script that this is trying to follow up on. Yeah. And this is not that. But it's cheeky and it's fun. Yeah. It's definitely not witty, but it does have a joie de vivre to it. Yeah. My notes just stop at a certain point. There's really nothing more to say. Like, the chases were pretty weak. Everyone kind of just goes with it at a certain point. They're like, ah, well, I guess I'm about to be killed by Michael. I'm just going to stand perfectly still while he slams me into a wall. <laughs> the ending scene is not super tense by any stretch of the imagination. And that's it. Yeah. No. Halloween 8. Yeah. The whole lead up to the climax, I love with the whole let's play the video game. Uh -huh. But yeah, once you then get into the shed and it's just, oh, she's pinned under something and there's electrical cables and fire and Buster Rhymes and Halloween motherfucker and all that stuff. It's just kind of like, eh. Yeah. I just kind of want it to be done by that point. It peters out. For me, it peaks with the uh, Kung Fu roundhouse fight. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into the box office release. Sure. What do you think the budget for this movie was? Oh my god. Uh, I don't want it to be over 18 million. <laughs> it is not. Okay, what is this? It is only 13. Okay, <laughs> that's a relief. <laughs> so let's look. It opened. Yeah, guess what time of the year this opened in? Well, it should be Halloween. I'm going to say July. July 12th. <laughs> yeah, because I remember it being summer. <laughs> It opened July 12th when Men in Black 2 was in its second week still at number one. Halloween Resurrection opened at number four. Huh. Below the debuts of Road to Perdition and Reign of Fire. I saw all of those. Man, I saw a lot of movies. Hey, guess what else debuted at number six? What's that? The Crocodile Hunter Collision Course. I saw that too. <laughs> <laughs> In its second week, Halloween Resurrection dropped to number eight. Road to Perdition had actually shot up to number one, and Stuart Little 2 opened at number two. A family favorite for my daughter. And right above Halloween Resurrection at number seven is the debut of Eight-Legged Freaks. That I did not see in the theater, but I believe I did rent it. Get away from me, you eight-legged freaks! <laughs> The original Snakes on a Plane. So in its third week, Halloween Resurrection dropped to number 12, but it's still around. And at number one was the debut of Austin Powers in Goldmember. Is that the second or third? Third. Oh, wow. Because, yeah, we're already up to 2002. Wow. It's so weird, because this one seems like it's 98. Yeah. Let's see, when was H2O? That was 97? So it's been five years. I'm like, it's two years later. It's obviously two years later. <laughs> it's been five. Wow. In its fourth week, Halloween is down to number 18. And at number one is the debut of Signs. I saw that. I remember liking that. And at number three, debuting higher than I thought it was, was Dana Carvey's The Master of Disguise. <laughs> oh, man. 
So in its, I think we're on fifth week now, in its fifth week, Halloween is down to number 26. And that was the debut of Triple X and Spy Kids 2, The Island of Lost Dreams. I went and saw Triple X for sure. I was a big Vin Diesel booster. So in its sixth week, Halloween is down to 33. I think I might just stop counting at some point because it's go down to 100 now. (laughs) I kind of want to see how this goes. (laughs) Triple X is still at number one. Wow. I didn't know it did that well. At number three, the debut of Blue Crush. Oh yeah, Blue Crush. At number 10, the debut of The Legendary. The Adventures of Pluto Nash. Wow, at number 10. That was like a huge bomb, I believe. And I still have not seen it to this day. Oh no, Box Office Mojo just stopped working. No! <laughs> okay, so we'll just kind of leave the box office off there, because it's six weeks, I think it went its run. What do you think this movie made in the long run? <sighs> For a 13 million budget, I'm going to say... 32 million. Close. 30. I'm getting good at this. Yeah. That's the one gift I've gotten from this podcast. I'm starting to get good at box office predictions. And you're adjusting for inflation. Yeah. (laughs) And if you give me a second here, I'm just opening up Wikipedia so I can see what came out in October. Because I'm just curious why they didn't release this one in October. We have Red Dragon. Oh, yeah. I went and saw that. Wow, that was at the same time? Man, my memory is getting crazy whack about this time. <laughs> the Rules of Attraction. I never saw it, but I heard good things. The Transporter. Oh, of course I saw that. I'm a big Jason Statham fan. <laughs> Tuck Everlasting. Still have not seen that. Ooh, oh, this might be why they didn't open in that month. The Ring. Oh, The Ring did boffo business, so they probably were right to not go up against The Ring. Oh, and I remember the horror film Ghost Ship, which opened the week after The Ring. Oh, poor Ghost Ship. Really? Ghost Ship? Yeah. Wow. That, I would swear that was earlier. Well, it was done by all the same people who did 13 Ghosts like two years before. Right, 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 which I saw that as well, but these were all renters for me. Like, I'd go see something like The Ring in the theater because it looked cool. Uh, let's see, also coming out, The Truth About Charlie, Jackass the Movie. <laughs> I saw that in the theaters. So yeah, so we're done with everything in October. It's like, okay, The Ring, but yeah. I don't know that they could have anticipated that The Ring would have been the juggernaut that it was. No, no, because the Japanese horror was not anything until the remake of The Ring, and then everyone yeah. started to catch wise. So yeah, it was a gamble. And nobody quite topped the remake of The Ring. No, no one did. They tried. Because dear God, is it a good movie. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm I'm kind of surprised that they didn't release it. Yeah, it's strange. Yeah, because The Ring, I remember it was like a word of mouth, kind of like sleeper hit, if I'm not right. mistaken. I know, that was when it kind of opened a little quiet, and then word of mouth, and then it blew up. Yeah, because if I knew what it was, I wouldn't have gone and saw it. It was like the scream effect, because I'm like very timid with a lot of horror films. Mm-hmm. And then I saw it, and I'm like, I was not aware of, and even though this was like the Americanized version, they still do it in that Japanese style, where I'm like, I was not prepared for that. And I'm just like, oh, long haired girl. Ah. <laughs> oh, and I'm even looking at, speaking of like a thematically similar horror movie, in August 30th, about a month and a half after Halloween Resurrection came out is when Fear.com came out. I was going to say, is it going to be Fear.com? Man, I have no sense of time. That same year. That is crazy to me. <laughs> I don't think we really have anything else left to add about Halloween Resurrection. No, we're talking about box office for Fear.com. So <laughs> and I looked at the recording thinking, oh, we've probably gone on for a couple hours. We're at an hour and six right now. And this movie <laughs> is an hour and 29. This episode will cut down to 35 minutes. Yeah, I think we could pretty much be like, <laughs> what do you think? Bad. The end. <laughs> Bad, but it has its charm. It does have its charms. Oh, God, we made it through all the Halloween <laughs> You know what? I didn't hate the process. It's been a no. long time. Uh, the last time I did it, I think I was a teen, so... <laughs> no, and I even recently re-listened to it. I'm actually really glad that we did Halloween 6 the way we did. I thought that turned out really well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. God, Halloween fucking 5. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we did it. Yeah. Alex, this has been a journey. It has. It has. It has been a journey. God, we're almost about to do the ward. <laughs> I know. It's strange to think about, but we still have a month. We still got a month. We got two more other episodes, and then we'll tackle the ward. Yep. So, if you want to bring us out... Thank you for joining us for our, sadly, last Halloween episode. Or is it? For now. For now, because, like Michael Myers, they keep coming back. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. 
All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. The Santa Claus 2 opening in October? Why would you open a Santa Claus movie in October? That's really weird. Sometimes they do it like for certain holidays for like families, but I oh. can't imagine what would be in October. Oh, no, nope, no. Nope. I stand corrected. Let's scratch those last two. I spy in the Santa Claus too, because I didn't realize I'm in November. Oh, yeah, it makes Merry more sense. Christmas. Yes, it does. <laughs>